All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today I am joined by ESPN's Michael Rothstein to take a look and recap the Falcons' Week 16 win over the Detroit Lions. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman. I've been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcons.com. RIP, still going strong on Twitter, at Falcons, and of course, the host of this preeminent Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today we are rejoined by Michael Ross, Dean of ESPN. Mike first showed up on the show after the Falcons embarrassing i guess you could call it loss to the dallas cowboys and <laughs> then mike was so embarrassed by that loss by the falcons that he did not appear on camera for that episode but today he is blessing us with his presence to talk about this detroit lions win uh and of course if you guys don't know mike uh he also covered the lions um for many years for espn so uh, towards the end of the show after we talk about not only this Falcons team and sort of where this win over the Lions sits, we'll get a little bit of insight from Mike on sort of where he sees this Lions team at in their current rebuild. But uh, Mike, welcome back to the show. Thanks. And just to be clear, I was not embarrassed because of the Falcons. I was embarrassed because I had just gotten off a plane and I looked like trash. That was what I was embarrassed by. Let's just let's just start, Aaron, and make sure that everybody understands that. <laughs> Well, okay, Mike, let's jump into this Lions win. Uh, you know, we'll take your word for that on your level of embarrassment. But, uh, uh, you know, w- are we at the point in the season where a win is a win, no matter how ugly a win you might call it? Or should we be looking for more at this point in the year from this Falcons team? Yeah, I think right now a win is a win. And, and it's, I asked, I forget which player, I think it was Foye Luikin, I asked about that after the game, like, did you feel like you just – there was a point in that game where you're just like, you have to try and survive. And he he didn't he didn't say no. He didn't really say yes, absolutely. But he said, yeah, there are times where you feel like that's what you have to do. And there is, I think, some element of that to every week in the NFL. But with this Falcons team where they're 7-2 and two in one loss in one possession games and they have not won a game by more than one possession this year – yeah, I think that that's just kind of a win is a win at this point because if you were the Falcons right now, and this has been a theme for as as improbable as it really has been, I think, probably since that Cowboys-Patriots stretch that we were talking about the last time I was on your show where you just looked at it and you were like, man, like uh, this team just can't play with really good t-. Every win managed to keep them – somewhat afloat in the playoff picture and at this point in the season if you can continue to win games whether they're pretty ugly whether they're by one point or 20 points or what what did dallas win by 40 again last night you know uh, whatever it might be it all counts the same as cliche as that is that's just the truth of it and for the falcons they are once again, you know, I got, I called the game against San Francisco maybe their biggest game in since 2018. And I would argue that now this game this week potentially is almost as big against Buffalo because you're once again playing a good team. You're going on the road. You have a chance to finally beat a good team, but you're still in this thing. You're still in the playoff picture. And while I think – Getting to the playoffs is unlikely. They have to win out and get some major help. That help isn't as unrealistic as I thought it was really even 48 hours ago. Fair enough. Now, you mentioned the Falcons' success in one-score games. They are 7-2 and uh, in those one-score games. I had a listener ask me a couple of weeks ago whether or not Arthur Smith and this new coaching staff deserves the bulk of the credit for this turnaround after going a year ago. They were 2-8. and in those one score, one possession games. Uh, I certainly said then that I thought Arthur Smith does deserve some of the credit, 
um, particularly in the games where the Falcons offense has gone down the field and, and gotten that game winning score, uh, given that he's the play caller, he deserves a lot of credit there. But I th- also thought it was probably not talked about enough that the Falcons are kind of facing a little bit of lighter competition, particularly at the quarterback position. You can kind of look at this year's Lions game versus last year's Lions game. It's a lot harder to stop Matt Stafford from going the length of the field than it is Tim Boyle uh, in order to win some of these close ball games. So what do you make of this? Is this improved coaching on the Falcons standpoint to, to have that sort of record turnaround in these close games? Is this regression uh, as they call it? Is it the level of competition or are we kind of at a point where uh, similarly you, you can't really li- look a gift horse in the mouth at this point, given that the Falcons are now winning these close games when they used to be blowing them? Yeah, it's definitely not regression. So you can take that away immediately because there's seven and two in one score games. Like you said, last year, they were two and eight. It's tough to say because you look at who they've played and I forget if we were talking about this on the last time I was on or not, but part of this for the Falcons this year is they have been very good and very competitive and more often than not won the games when they've played what I consider like, or in some cases, inferior competition but like competition maybe even a step above if you want to maybe talk about new orleans and a couple of other games that they've played those games against those they've been in it and like i said they're seven and two all seven of their wins have come against those types of teams it's when they play the really really good teams that it clearly doesn't work out so well for them so i say that listen you're playing the teams that are probably around your talent level too because this roster is, you know, a bottom 10 roster in the NFL. And, and maybe that's a little on the high side. And you're seven and eight. Like, that, that that's good, like, by any metric. And I think some of that goes to Matt Ryan. I think a lot of that goes to the coaching staff. I think that goes to some of the guys who play smaller roles that don't get a lot of attention. Young Way Koo, Kyle Pitts. You know, I, I saw someone tweet – you know, he's got 949 yards, and they're like, oh, that's the quietest. It's like, what do you want the guy to do? <laughs> I mean, you know, so I look at it, and I, I see those pieces, and I say, well, that's part of why they're able to win these one-score games. And I'll have this story up on ESPN tomorrow, to meaning Tuesday, in that I look at it, and to me, this is what they're doing. Whether they make the playoffs or not, whether they finish 7 and – 10 or finished eight and nine or or they finished nine and eight whatever this ends up being uh you can take what you're seeing from atlanta right now and from arthur smith and think that this can be something that's on beyond this year and that is just this identity thing and arthur smith has talked about it a lot that like two three years down the road identity wants them to be a really physical football team win on the offensive line, win on the defensive line. You can argue how much they really do that this year. But I think that there is something for a resiliency factor. And I think that's something that can be ingrained into a culture and ingrained into a team, even as a lot of the pieces and the parts and the players, if your core is there and your core has been around for that and your coach you know, really stresses that, and he, yesterday after the game, he kind of said that that was the team ethos a little bit. So clearly they're stressing it. That to me is something you can take from these one possession games, whether that means the playoffs this year or not, and build on that next year when theoretically, who knows what this offseason is going to look like. This roster could look better or at least a lot different than it does right now. Okay. And on that note, we'll continue today's Locked On Falcons talking a little bit about uh, Kyle Pitts's quiet 949 yard season and, and sort of whether or not he deserves a lot more praise for that quiet year, as well as get into uh, a little bit more of this offseason conversation with getting Mike's insights on what the Falcons are going to do at the linebacker position where you have two players in Foyer, Alua Khan and Deion Jones seemingly at a crossroads uh, with their time in Atlanta. We'll talk about the future of that as well as get Mike's thoughts on this Lions team coming up on today's Locked on Falcons podcast, guys. Before we get into all of that, I want to thank everybody who makes Locked on Falcons their first listen each and every day. And of course, Locked on Falcons is free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, and Spotify. And of course, now free and available on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the Locked on Falcons YouTube channel. And when you do, give us that like and give us a comment. 
So we're continuing today's Locked on Falcons. And, uh, you know, it was a big week for Kyle Pitts being named to the Pro Bowl on Wednesday, breaking the Falcons single season record for yards for a tight end on Sunday. He also now has moved into second place behind Mike Dicka for the most yards for a rookie tight end. You know, and you kind of talked about it already, but there's been a lot of talk over the last several weeks about Kyle Pitts kind of having a disappointing season. Um, You know, I think a lot of that's owed to the extremely high expectations uh, given where he was drafted and given the fact that the Falcons lost Julio Jones this offseason and then lost Calvin Ridley during the season. So I I guess does this week that Kyle Pitts has had kind of help recontextualize uh, that he's actually been really good this year and, and deserves his flowers? Yeah, absolutely. And part of that too, and I've I've talked about it at times too, and I've written it, is that they need, I felt like at times they needed more, but I always stress this. And I think we talked about this the last time I was on as well, that rookie tight ends struggle in the NFL. There is a level of inconsistency with rookie tight ends because they're being asked to do so much. And some people say, oh, well, Kyle Pitts is a glorified receiver. He's just a big receiver. And yeah, the Falcons use him outside and in the slot a lot. But he is also used in line as a tight end. He still, even if he's not used there a ton, still has to learn all of that. It's not like he can just go sit out there on the X or sit out there in the, or just sit in the slot and only learn that. He has to learn all of these things. So for to really understand what he's doing, it's an impressive year. And yeah, he's he had a stretch where he had some bad games. And we're seeing it right now from Cordero Patterson. Cordero Patterson's having a stretch right now where he's not playing particularly well, even though he scored uh, on Sunday. But going back to Pitts in that is just that's just to say, listen, in a long season, there are going to be stretches where he hasn't played well. You look at what Kyle Pitts has done over the last month, and that I think is a lot of what people expected from him. And I think when we're talking about disappointment, I'm going to use air quotes on that. And people can see me this time and see me doing the air quotes. (laughs) I think it it totally comes from one factor. I think if Kyle Pitts had five touchdowns, no one would call this season a disappointment. I think it's just that he hasn't gotten in the end zone. So, so many people, when they look at fantasy football, when they look at statistics, they look at the end zone. They look at touchdowns. They don't realize that the guy who's moving them beyond the 20s, the guy who's making the big plays on third downs, is Kyle Pitts, and he just isn't necessarily getting the ball in the end zone. And if any team should understand that, it should be the Falcons fans, because Falcons fans saw this with Julio Jones year after year after year after year after year. I think I hit all of the years. And you look at it, and you're just like, listen, Kyle Pitts is a really good player. He's going to be a great player in this league. If he stays healthy and plays at this pace, he is going to be wearing a gold jacket one day. I mean, that's just kind of the reality and i don't want to you know kind of pump him up that much but that's just the truth of what we're seeing from him as long as again he stays healthy he has that type of potential and that type of talent and listen a rookie hasn't made the a rookie a rookie tight end hasn't made the pro bowl for 19 years since jeremy shockey in 2002 kyle pitts did that kyle pitts is going to be in the top five in rookie as as a rookie in tight end history, in receptions and yards, and, and might end up by the end of it holding the yardage record. I don't know if he's going to get to the receptions record. They probably would him a little bit more than they would do the next two weeks of the season. And, and you know, even then, people are going to say, "Well, he had 17 games to do it in." Well, okay, fine. People are like, "Well, Mike Dick had you know got 1,076 yards in 14 games," and that's true. But I will also say this. Think of how many tight ends that have come along since who have played in 16 games and haven't gotten anywhere close to what Kyle Pitts is doing because Kyle Pitts has now gotten to 930 yards in 15 games. And that's the second best all time. So Kyle Pitts is having a fantastic season and you have to think with a full off season, what he's going to be next year. And theoretically with more help, if Calvin Ridley comes back, if they add a running more of a running game if they add another wide receiver whether that ends up being russell gage or somebody else because they have a lot of free agents in that receiver room whether hayden hurst returns and i mean listen he's a free agent and probably can get more money elsewhere truthfully but you all of a sudden have a different running mate or hayden hurst 
in that offense too. And there are so many weapons and so many options. So therefore he's not getting the double coverage that maybe he's getting all the time now, man, like there's a chance for him next year to do something even more special than I think what he's doing this year. And I think when people look back on this five years from now, they're going to be like, wow, that was impressive. Yeah, I think so. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, the wide receiver and tight end position in the upcoming off season. Uh, but the Falcons have an interesting dynamic in the linebacker room as well. Afoye Aluakun is coming off arguably his best game of the year, having a team high 14 tackles and the game ceiling interception. Now we've kind of seen Deion Jones these last couple of weeks kind of look a little lackluster in, in some of these games. So Olakun's a free agent. Deion Jones is technically under contract, but it seems like it's a tradable contract if the Falcons did decide to move on. What what are your expectations for what the Falcons will do with both of these players this offseason? Will one, neither, or both of these guys be back in Atlanta in 2022? I I don't know the answer to that, obviously. Uh, And I don't think anyone does at this point. I, I don't even think that the front office probably knows that answer at this point because... If you're Foye Aluakin at this point, and, and I say this just because I've covered the league long enough, if a guy reaches this point in the season and he's a free agent, typically he's at least going to, as agent, feel out the waters of free agency. Get a sense of what that money is going to look like. And then now with the legal tampering period, you can do that even more so. And, and if you think that, by the way, those conversations aren't happening beforehand, like there was an awesome bridge I'd like to sell you or, you know, a nice plot of land in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or something like those conversations happen. And I think right now, if you're Foyer Lugan's agent, you're spending, you know, in January, February, early March, getting a sense of what that market is going to be for him and what the Falcons willing to offer. If I'm the Falcons, I think I'm to me, he's maybe the third most important re-signing for them or the third guy I would target. And that's not a knock on FOIA. It's just, you you can probably lock up Young Mike, who is a restrictive free agent for cheaper, or you put a tag on him. And then if someone wants to give, you know, a second or a first round tender on him, I I think you you very well are letting Young Mike go at that point. And then you have to make a decision on Cordero Patterson. And then Foye to me is the guy after that, that you really have to sit and make a decision on and, and all of it blends and meshes together. So I don't know that. I think it's going to depend on frankly, what the Falcons look in the draft and, and see, is this a very heavy linebacker class that they like? And the second part of that is, do they want to invest in Foye Lewicken? Do they want to make him a true centerpiece of their defense? If the answer to that question is yes, then I think you find a way to pay him. Deion Jones is a completely different situation because Deion Jones, when I've looked at his contract and me, for me understanding his contract, there's enough guaranteed money there that I would be surprised if he's not on the roster. But like you said, if a team is willing to take that money, like contracts can be traded, right? If a team's willing to work with the Falcons and maneuver that, then maybe he, it could happen. But other than that, I see Deion Jones on this team next year, and I think that you can see him maybe in a role that Dean Pease can fit even better. Dean Pease is one of the best defensive coordinators around. Like, there's no reason to think that with another year and now understanding that, and again, going back to getting more pieces, more guys doing, you can find an even better role for Deion Jones than the role he's been in now. The thing that stuck out to me with Deion Jones is it feels like he's missed a lot of tackles, and that to me is a concern, but... I still think he's doing pretty decently in coverage and you know, he was banged up a couple of weeks ago and who knows how healthy he currently is. A lot of guys play through a lot of stuff at this time of year, especially if there's playoff berths on the line. Okay. All right. Uh, We'll see what uh, comes from that. Uh, And we still got more uh, to talk with Mike about on today's locked on Falcons, although it may be a little bit more locked on lions because we'll get Mike's thoughts 
on the team that he formerly covered. Don't tell of, Matt Perry I'm cheating on him. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll get more into that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. But before we get there, guys, I want to let you guys know about the ultimate college football playoff preview now available on the Locked on Podcast Network. You can find it on its own feed by searching ultimate college football playoff preview, previewing all the big games, big bowl games and playoff matchups ahead of this weekend's action and go check it out on whatever your preferred podcast platform is. Now, it's the holiday season, and of course, BetOnline has had you covered all season long as far as betting action for this football season, whether we're talking about NFL or college football. Obviously, we have playoffs for both uh, coming up, and of course, BetOnline remains your number one spot for all that Action, but better lines not just about football, they're about NBA, NHL, UFC, boxing, all the way to your favorite Vegas casino games. Bet online remains the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. So just head to the new updated desktop or mobile website at betonline.ag, sign up today, and make sure when you do use that promo code locked on, you'll get a 50% welcome bonus. That means if you deposit 200 bucks, you get $100 in free money to play with that you can put towards the Falcons, against the Falcons, towards your favorite college football team, or again, to NBA, NHL, and more. So don't wait. Take advantage of all the amazing offers available at Bet Online, where the game starts. So, Mike, uh, wrapping up today's Locked on Falcons, talking a little Lions. Um, obviously, you covered that team for many years for ESPN. Kind of wanted to get your thoughts on where this team is headed under Dan Campbell, just because you can provide a little bit of a unique perspective to that. I came away pretty impressed from this game. Obviously, I don't have a huge sample size of Lions games that I've watched this season, but it, it felt like given what they were dealing with, particularly with a backup quarterback, they kind of executed for the most part, at least 99% of the way there, uh, a winning game plan by running the football, controlling time of possession, um, you know, getting enough stops on defense. And, you know, it all got thwarted at the one yard line in the last 30 seconds of the game. So, um, you know, I, I came away thinking that this team is playing particularly hard for Dan Campbell and kind of has been punching above its weight all season long. What do you say about this Lions team that you used to cover? I mean, I think that's similar to the Falcons in that you're seeing a first-year head coach sometimes learning on the fly. And you're seeing a team that I think, again, punching, like you said, above their weight. Now, the Falcons are winning those games. The Lions are, in a lot of times, coming close. I would argue the Lions have had a much tougher schedule than the Falcons overall. I mean, and they've lost on like a 66-yard field goal, too. I mean, like this just typical, like insane Lions things that happen. Like the Falcons don't have a monopoly on weird and wacky happening to them. I mean, when these two teams play, every game now has come down to the last four times has come down to the last play or now the second to last play because there was a kneel down of the game. That's just how, what these teams do. I was impressed also with what Dan Campbell has done. And I wrote a lot, a lengthy profile about Dan Campbell after he got hired. It's actually the last real piece I wrote about the Lions before I moved over to cover the Falcons. And I spent a lot of time trying to understand who he was. And one thing that was told to me over and over is that the dude is not going to change. He is who he is. And that's going to come off very authentic within that locker room. And he's, going to be the guy that you saw in the press conference maybe that was like dialed up to like 100 a little bit you know in that in that opening press conference but that the general sentiment is there and from talking to people the last few days around Detroit that's the sense I've got is that that is who he has been and we talked with him on Wednesday he did uh, an opposing comp, uh, opposing coach press call and he was great and was very similar to the guy that I've seen in a couple of other press conferences this year and the guy I spoke when for the story I wrote back in March. There is the possibility that he could be the guy. And I'm not saying like he's going to lead them to a Super Bowl or anything. We all know how hard that is. But I think he's a guy that's going to be able to turn this turn the Lions franchise a little bit. And so much of that's going to be what Brad Holmes does with their draft picks how they develop those draft picks, what guys they bring in in free agency, what they do with the quarterback situation, whether that ends up being Jared Goff or somebody else. So they do have things there, but I've been very impressed by what I've seen from Dan Campbell 
And I think that players are really gravitating towards that. And you can kind of see it. And it, it, listen, the NFL, more than anything else, and Aaron, you know this, you've been around for a while. More teams than not are successful because they have a coach who is, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. He respects his players, but it's as much of a CEO situation as it is like genius play caller, right? And Dan Campbell took over play calling midway through the season from Anthony Lynn. And from what I, talking to some people around Detroit, it's kind of, it seems like Ben Johnson, their tight ends coach has had a real hand in that. And I guess Ben Johnson and Arthur Smith have some connections too, but you, you look at that and you say, okay, well, the guy made a big move and he's now learning play calling on the fly, but he's never really called offensive plays before. But I, I think a lot of the moves he's made has been smart. And it goes to what I was talking about before about the one score game situation in Atlanta, how it's building a culture. I think what we're seeing from Dan Campbell in Detroit is that he is also building the type of culture that he wants. And so far, what it's looked like is it's manifested positively in Detroit situation, maybe not in wins and losses, but in what you're seeing about how this team plays, understanding what this roster is. And that's something that, again, I think when you give a guy, when you give guys six year contracts, which are hot, more than the traditional contract, that is signaling, hey, listen, this is going to be a rebuild. And I was covering them when they got rid of Matt Patricia. Patricia and Bob Quinn and everybody clear they understood that this was going to probably have to be a big rebuild, especially once they got rid of Matthew Stafford. And you're starting to see the bits and pieces of that. Like this Lions team might be really bad again next year, right? 2023 to me is when they have to start showing some real progress. And it's interesting because, and not to go off too much here, but you look at it and I think the Falcons and the Lions are very similar franchises, even though probably both sides don't necessarily want to admit that. Mm -hmm. In that they both have been mildly successful at points. The Falcons have been more successful than the Lions as they've gotten to Super Bowls. But they they operate similarly. And they they just feel the same. And they've had similar heartaches. And you see it in that I think both franchises are are on we're on similar pathways. Now what the Lions did with Matthew Stafford, we'll see what happens with Matt Ryan in the offseason. So it's always felt like they're on similar paths. And I don't think the Falcons will go total rebuild. I just don't see that happening. I think what we've seen this year probably says you don't necessarily need to do that, where you can more retool while you're figuring things out with certain players. But I like what I've seen from Detroit so far. And you know, I think it's something that Detroit and Atlanta, again, have in common. They have these coaches that have their players playing way better than the roster would say it should be. And that sounds funny for a two-win team to say that, but it does feel like that with the Lions, and it's certainly the case in Atlanta. Well, Mike, uh, I appreciate your insight there, and we'll give the Lions credit for two and a half wins, right? That tie counts. So, sure, uh, absolutely. I mean, but again, that, that tie was against a team that's in the playoff hunt. They yeah. beat Arizona. Now, Arizona's, you know, in the midst of a free fall, but they beat, they beat at that point, the team that was the best team in the NFC. Like, they've been competitive. And they beat the Vikings, a team that could also very well be in the playoffs. Like, they might have two wins and a tie against playoff teams, which is mm -hmm. like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so... Uh, Mike, I really do appreciate you uh, joining me here on today's episode and, and giving your unique insights to not only this Falcons team, but also the Lions. Uh, go ahead. You already mentioned, you know, what your upcoming content is, but go ahead and plug that as well as anything else that you feel like plugging. Yeah. So you, I have a podcast as well because everybody has a podcast. <laughs> I have a podcast. It's called From the Perch. You can find it uh drops on mondays and on thursdays you can find it anywhere you listen to your podcasts spotify apple all the places that aaron has mentioned where his podcast is uh it's also at a place called podcast park and you can read all my stuff at espn.com and you can follow me on twitter and on instagram right there below what it says mike rothstein that's also you can put the little ig thing there too because i'm on instagram there as well as well as twitter uh, i try to be as engaging as possible with my followers on Twitter, even if that sometimes gets me in a little bit of annoyance because, you know, some guy tried, some tried, guy tried to wish me, wish COVID on me like yesterday. And I was so confused. I, like, why does that happen? But anyway, 
please don't do that if you come interact with me. <laughs> but uh, more than happy to engage. We take questions for every Monday show as well. So happy to engage there as well. Aaron, thanks again for having me, man. Yeah, man. I haven't had anybody wish that on me yet. So clearly, I'm not doing a good enough job. Uh, no, I think you're doing a better job because people are not <laughs> like, I was just like, when this happened, I was like, why? What, 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 what would, why would you do this? <laughs> Yes, pretty weird. Pretty weird place to be. Uh, but Mike, yeah, uh, great to have you on. Share your insights into this uh, week 16 win for the Falcons. We'll see what's left for this team in the remainder of 2021. And for those listeners out there that want to make a little bit more money off of what's left for not only the Falcons, but all of sports in the calendar year of 2021, there's still time and you can do so by subscribing to the Locked on Bets podcast available everywhere you can find from the perch or Locked on Falcons. And of course, you're getting daily picks, blowout specials and Lee's lock of the day from handicapping expert Lee Sterling of Paramount Sports on the Locked on Bets podcast. So go check that out, guys. And that will do it for us here on Locked on Falcons. Tomorrow's episode will be an all 22 review in Q&A. So if you want to send in your questions, you can do so on Twitter at Locked on Falcons, Facebook at Locked on Falcons. You can send an email to Locked on Falcons at mail.com, or you can leave a comment here on the Locked on Falcons YouTube channel. That's going to do it for us today on Locked on Falcons. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks to Mike once again. Until then.